Susan, thank you so much for the lovely introduction and thank you also to the Center for hosting this event and for hosting me. I am so sorry not to be able to be there with you today. I really, although I am, you know, it's Zoom is great and everything, it breaks my heart that I can't be there with you and that I can't meet you all in person. Um, and I really hope that, fingers crossed, maybe in 2021, we will have a chance to meet in person. Um, so hang in there, everybody. I know you're probably just as impatient with this situation as I am. Rebecca, can you turn up your audio a little bit, please? I can hold the mic closer to my face. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, now. I will speak louder. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you, if that's OK. And I will get started. Let's see. The only problem with sharing the screen, of course, is that you won't be able to see me as clearly. Um, but I think that's OK. So I want, well, I don't need to introduce the book because Susan has already done this for me. And she's already flagged up the fact that, um, oh, you can have a look at the book if you like. Um, here it is. She's flagged up basically that, you know, kind of the two most important things about the book is it's really about memory and not just the memory of this small group of child survivors. There's a hundred uh, child survivors whose stories I look at in the book. But actually, it, it flags up, certainly for me, the broader ways in which we all engage with memories of our childhood. In particular, for me, it raised the question of how do we, how does one tell um, the life story when you don't know really where you come from? Um, because it strikes me that after many, you know, more than a decade of doing oral history now, that knowing your origins is a fundamental part of being able to tell your own life story. So that's partly what drove me to want to look at this very young group of child survivors, because they actually are a way into exploring that question of how you explain who you are when you don't really maybe fully understand where you came from. You, you, you don't know the community where you were born. You might not know what happened to your parents. In a few rare cases, you might not even know your own birth name. But today, what I want to talk to you about is, um, is what circumstances shape what we can and cannot say when we tell the stories of our lives. What constraints hold us back? And then how do these circumstances change over time? And although I'm talking about this very specific group of children who survived the Holocaust, I'm really hoping that everybody listening will see some ways in which this might apply to their own lives. Uh, because of course, we all tell our stories differently at different points as we move through our lives and as history changes with us and around us. So, I want to take you on a bit of a whistle-stop tour through several decades of interviews with child survivors of the Holocaust, considering how they've told their stories in changing historical contexts through the 20th and early 21st centuries. I want to think about what these youngest survivors have and have not said as they told their stories to different audiences over the course of their lifetimes, and what sort of factors set the boundaries of what it was possible or politic to say at different points. In particular, I think we often run up against an assumption that what held survivors, and it's true for adult survivors as well, um, what held them back from telling their stories was a psychological problem, particularly the idea of repression. And today's talk aims to challenge that assumption. I hope to show that far more important than the psychological restraints of the speaker were the assumptions and goals of the audience. But I want to start with two stories, because as Susan has said, um, I've tried really hard in this book to put the stories first. And I actually think what, you know, what brings me back to this topic again and again and again is the stories. So I'm going to start with two stories. The first one takes place here. The Weir Courtney Care Home for Child Survivors of the Holocaust, uh, located in Lingfield in Surrey. So this is a, a British care home for child survivors, uh, which opened in December 1945. Here's a picture of it. It was actually a kind of, I mean, the, the children who lived in this care home, um, it was sort of a dedicated wing of a country manor house. So it was converted into a care home for child survivors. All the children there were under the age of 12 when they arrived um, in 1945 and 1946. By mid-1946, there were two dozen children who lived there. So it was a very it was a small care home. 
Um, the children had survived uh, to Regenstadt ghetto camp. They had survived. Rebecca, it has to be louder. I'm sorry. Oh. Can you uh, turn? It's up all the way. That's a concern. Hmm. Let me try unplugging it's the mic. It, it, it is better now. Is it? Yes. I'm really sorry. I don't know why. It's always, it's never failed me before. Let's put it that way. Um, let me just go quickly into the into the microphone system. Susan, bear with me for a second. Yeah. Is this any better? Or is it about the same? Sounds good. The okay. feedback is it sounds good. Okay, I hope that is the case. I will put the mic away. Is it still okay? Yes. Right. Apologies to everybody. I'm going to use the microphone built into the computer now. Okay, so back to We Are Courtney. Um, which Susan knows I have a kind of obsessive interest in this particular one orphanage. See, she's laughing, so she knows. And uh, I'm actually writing my next book about this, this one particular orphanage because it's quite a special place. So as I was saying, the children there are survivors of Theresienstadt, of Auschwitz, and some of them survived in hiding. But what's interesting about this home is that it was very closely linked to Anna Freud, of course, the daughter of Sigmund Freud. And herself the founder of, of the field of child psychoanalysis. She actually sort of sponsors this home and she keeps very close tabs on it in a lot of ways as well. So psychoanalytic principles were a fundamental part of the functioning of Weir Courtney. Now the matron, Alice Goldberger, here she is, she herself was training as a lay psychoanalyst under Anna Freud. And um, as was the case in other care homes, it was not a unique place in this regard. Um, staff followed contemporary psychoanalytic theory and practice, and Goldberger and her team believed that encouraging children to speak about what they had seen during the war had a potential therapeutic uh, quality. So they worked really hard to create a very warm environment and a very open environment where talking was not just possible, it was encouraged. But staff were nonetheless frequently troubled uh, by the children's behavior, and they kept very careful notes on this. And in particular, Alice Goldberger was worried about one girl, Mina R. She is on the far right here, clutching a doll. She was a survivor of Theresienstadt. And staff recorded that her behavior was puzzling. Um, her language was stilted. Her emotions didn't seem natural, and they were particularly worried that she always seemed to have this sort of false smile frozen on her face. One day, this girl revealed to staff at the home how, during the war, she had seen her mother shot through the head right in front of her. So Goldberger encouraged the child to unburden herself of her painful memories. She then recorded that after this dramatic and sudden revelation, Mina's behavior seemed to improve. Speaking did indeed appear to have had a therapeutic effect. So staff at the care home were utterly dumbfounded when six years later, Mina's mother showed up alive, having never been shot through the head at all. The second story. This is a Canadian story. Erin B, born in Bialystok in July, 1935. He was interviewed by officers from the Canadian Jewish Congress in 1947 in the hopes of joining Canada's War Orphans Program. Now, in case you don't know about the program, um, Canada was one of a small handful of countries that had a, a scheme to bring child concentration camp survivors to the country after the war. Actually, incidentally, the, the children who were at Weir Courtney were on the similar scheme for Britain. Uh, and this was run by the Canadian Jewish Congress. So here you can see a, a flyer from the scheme. Uh, the Ch Canadian Jewish Congress aimed to bring a thousand Jewish war orphans to Canada between 1947 and 1952. Children hoping to join the scheme were generally interviewed by caseworkers in the European DP camps where they were living. So those caseworkers asked them to relate their life stories and the details of what had happened to them during the war. But it's important to keep in mind here that there was a very specific function to all that story gathering. It was to see if the children were eligible for the scheme. It wasn't just to um, offer them a therapeutic moment to, to 
tell the story of what they had been through during the war. And you'll see, of course, from the very title of the scheme, War Orphans Program, that it's clear it was only open to orphans. So both the adults listening and the children speaking knew that a great deal rested on the story itself. So if we go back to a minute for a minute to Aaron B. He was interviewed by officers from the Canadian Jewish Congress in 1947. So he was an early joiner on the scheme. And he told his story as follows. He had lived with his parents in Vilna until 1941. Then his parents had taken him to live with friends in the country before being deported to a labor camp. His maternal aunt had found him in the countryside and had taken him to live with her after the war. Sorry, bear with me. He believed that his parents, who he named as Chaim and Helena B, had been killed in a concentration camp. But his aunt Ruth B was alive and living in a nearby DP camp, training to be a seamstress. Aaron's case workers took the boy's story at face value. And if they puzzled over the fact, as you might have already noticed, that his maternal aunt seemed to have the same last name as he did, there is no record of it. He was accepted onto the program. He arrived in Canada from Austria in February 1948. And Ruth B arrived two months later, benefiting from her seamstress training to join a scheme intended to bring skilled DPs to Canada. Canada was one of the few countries that had such a scheme. The Canadian Jewish Congress remained oblivious to the fact that something was not right with Aaron B's story, although by the time his file closed in 1950, they seemed to have grown suspicious. The last document in his file, dated 2nd of February 1950, mentioned that Mrs. B, I don't know if you can see me doing air quotes here, she was the aunt, the aunt who had come as a DP tailor. Both Aaron's story and Mina's one alert us to the pressures that shaped child Holocaust survivors, uh, say, sorry, that shaped what child Holocaust survivors could and could not say about their wartime experiences in the early post-war period, and just how far these stories were often fabrications. In Aaron's case, as you have probably already concluded, the fabricated element was purely pragmatic. The person who he named as his aunt was, of course, actually his mother. And if he had revealed that his mother was alive, he would not have qualified for the program. And in fact, interestingly enough, the two people who he, he named as his father and mother were in fact his aunt and uncle who were killed in a concentration camp. That lie allowed him to subvert the imposed rules and get himself and his mother out of the DP camp and on towards a new life in Canada. And I think we can all understand the motivation and probably many of us would have done the same. The fabrication in Mina's case was perhaps equally pragmatic, albeit in a different way. But to understand this, we need to consider the expectations of the adults who were listening to her. Children in environments like the Weir Courtney care home were aware that their carers hoped they would talk about the war. In other words, they were aware that there was a reward to be had for speaking even if the reward was simply the approval of the people who cared for them. They may have obliged adults by providing stories that seem to explain their behaviors and emotions in the present, the then present. Place. Indeed, the value of stories like Mina's and Aaron's lie not in their faith to facts, but in their very departure from them. Child Holocaust survivors did not hesitate to present creatively reimagined pasts for adult consumption when the need arose. And in so doing, I believe they reveal themselves there as historical agents in their own right, because for those of us who work on children, it can be very hard to locate the agency of children in the past. Uh, they don't leave a great deal sort of in their own voice or written by their own hand in the archives. But we might look at Mina's story and see there, not the story of a child describing seeing her mother shot, that was a fabrication, but rather a small act of defiance and a small assertion of will a brief window onto the child herself as a subject as she pushed back against these concerns of her carers. Equally in Aaron's story, we see a child asserting his will against the bureaucratic parameters set out by the adults who were in theory trying to help him. Nor are these isolated examples. When we look at the stories that child survivors told to adults in the early post-war period, 
we see that these children who were still very young, keep in mind, I, I, I should have explained that all the, I think Susan might have said, all the children in this book were born in 1935 or afterwards. So they were all 10 years old or younger at the time of the, the, the end of the war. So they were very young children. And we see that these children gave stories that were shot through with efforts to conceal and refute and adapt memories to fit the requirements imposed by their carers and other adults. Some child survivors also, of course, had ample practice in hiding aspects of their identities. The majority of child survivors of the Holocaust had survived in hiding, sometimes with false identities, and they were practiced at telling a story of who they were that was not true. Some children had also developed a deep distrust of adults during the war for quite clear reasons. And having honed those skills of concealment and creative reimagining re of the past, and sometimes outright fabrication, during the war, then children were ready to use that skill set after the liberation. May scholars have recently begun to work on children's early post-war accounts of their experiences of the Holocaust, of which there were many. Um, I, it will be no surprise to anyone who works in this area, but it was a surprise to me when I started working on this area to discover there are hundreds of very early post-war accounts of children's Holocaust experiences. And there's a good handful of scholars across the globe now working on those very precious documents. But we should take care, I think, not simply to take those accounts at face value, but to understand children's words in the web of their complex relationship with adults with humanitarian aid organizations and with immigration schemes. The restrictions of the environment, the children's ongoing suspicion of authority figures, the practice of maintaining dual identities, and their own perception about the need to conceal certain elements of their histories, all worked to ensure that children weren't really free to speak as they might have wanted to in that early post-war period. But if we encounter silences in those stories, they're not necessarily the science, silences imposed by the psyche. Rather, they stemmed from the rules, expectations, and assumptions of an adult world of carers. And they shed light on children's ability to work around those limitations. So what difference would we find if we jumped forwards in time to when the children are adults themselves? The first thing is we actually have to jump forwards quite a bit because um, what I tried to do in the book was look at the children, this group of 100 children, through all the decades of their lives. But there's decades for which there's really rich documentation and there's decades for which there's almost nothing. And really, especially the 1950s and 1960s, a period in which you just can't find a great deal in the archive. You can find enough, and certainly uh, if you, you know, want to read the book, you'll see, yes, there is something there, but it, is, it doesn't really get rich again until the 1970s. So I should explain why. Actually, I, ha I, I don't know if Susan, Susan and I have talked about this, but um, the Canadian Jewish Congress actually, uh, I think it was in 1950, 57, 58, 59, sort of in the late 50s, they actually tried to reach out and track down the child survivors who had come on the program and to do a sort of follow-up questionnaire survey with them. And I searched, I searched, and I searched through Canadian archives to try to find these questionnaires because it's so rare that you have anything from child survivors from that period, right, the late 1950s, that in which they might honestly express how they're feeling or coping or what they're thinking about. And they are gone. And that is sad. That is really sad. Maybe one day one of you will find them, but I've searched quite extensively and I never could. But anyway, to the, to the 1970s. Uh, it's in the late 1970s and the early 1980s, early to mid 1980s, that a new audience emerged for child survivors' stories. And this was specifically psychologists and psychoanalysts who were at that time engaged in a wider professional argument about the nature of trauma and specifically whether or not traumatic events could have long-term psychological consequences. So this wasn't, you know, specifically about child survivors of the Holocaust, but they end up getting quite wrapped up in this bigger debate that of course leads to the, um, 
diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, which only only comes around um, some, something that is actively debated through the 70s and enters the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Psychiatry in 1980. Now, of course, at that point in the late 70s, the youngest child survivors were entering middle age. They had established careers, they had raised their children, they had gained some distance from the past. We might expect to find at this point that they were freer to tell their stories on their own terms. Yet here we find a different set of constraints that shaped what they could and couldn't say. By some measures, they were freer. Uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, sorry, 70s and 80s, I should say, straight through to the 1990s, there wasn't yet really a precedent for telling what might be a recognizable child Holocaust survivor's story. There wasn't even the term child Holocaust survivor yet that as a concept didn't develop until the mid 1980s. But in other ways, however, the expectations at the core of these story gathering projects dramatically shaped what interviewees felt they could or could not say to interviewers. They favored, these projects favored what uh, historian Henry Greenspan has called psychiatric discourses, narratives that reflected on the lasting consequences of trauma on a survivor's life. In other words, the interviewers running these projects, who were all mental health experts, um, they all engaged in what you might see as a sort of hunt for trauma in these interviews. There were several such projects uh, launched in the late 1970s and the 1980s, of which the most influential is probably known to many of you. Um, it's now called the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies, um, and it's been housed at Yale University since 1982. But more important for the purposes today uh, is a relatively lesser known scheme, one that was founded by psychoanalyst um, Judith Kestenberg in 1981, which is called the International Study of the Organized Persecution of Children Project. A very impressive project in scope because uh, Kestenberg and her team managed to collect, I think it's 1,500 interviews with child survivors, which, so it's the, it, is, it remains the largest uh, project of its kind. Kestenberg's primary goal was to understand how children experience and remember persecution and how this affects their psychological health. She believed that having been hunted by the Nazis had left what she called an indelible influence on children, no matter how young they had been at the time. And with her team of interviewers, she developed what they called kinesthetic techniques that prompted interviewees to tell their stories without relying on concrete memories but rather by drawing on their senses and their imaginations. Kestenberg and her team, based in New York City, interviewed hundreds of child survivors in the early to mid 1980s. So there are now 1,500 um, interviews in that collection, but it did go on until the 1990s, actually possibly even later. Most of the survivors they interviewed in that time were living in the United States. It's important to remember that at the same time and in the same place, Fashions in popular psychology had begun to embrace the idea of so-called recovered memories, which seemed to offer the promise that childhood experiences that could not be remembered, and upsetting ones in particular, could be retrieved from the depths of the unconscious adult mind via techniques like hypnosis and guided imagery. The methods used by Kestenberg and her team bore striking similarities to those used by recovered memory therapists. They employed guided imagery techniques, they privileged emotions and sensations, and they discouraged their interviewees from doubting the validity of the memories that they recovered. Now, this is not to um, uh, suggest that they were not competent as mental health experts. It's simply to say they were products of their time, as we all are. So I want to show you an example. Um, I unfortunately don't have a photo. I wish I did. Uh, this is the story of Aniko S, who was born in 1942 in Szeged, Hungary. <clears throat> so 1942, she was too young to remember being deported from the Szeged ghetto to Theresienstadt with her mother and brother in 1944. Now I should explain for a minute that uh, I am not a psychologist, um, but I really enjoyed as part of my preparation for this project, 
so crawling up in the part of our university library where all the bookshelves are, you know, the books are, the bookshelves are lined with books about child developmental psychology and having a really good read through those. Absolutely fascinating. And one of the things I was very interested to read about is the concept of infantile amnesia. And what that means is that um, psychologists uh, generally agree, although they don't necessarily agree why, they generally agree we cannot remember things that have happened to us before the age of about three. It's a little bit different in different cultures, but roughly the age when memory turns on is about three years old. Although we sometimes fervently believe that we can remember things before that age, experiments have shown that we can't. So if that is the case, and what's interesting is that uh, uh, developmental psychologists don't, still don't understand why that happens, but certainly there is a, a rich kind of theories about it and they're very interesting. In any case, Aniko was only two at the time she arrived in the ghetto camp of Theresienstadt, so she could not possibly remember the experience. So her interviewer for the Kestenberg project took her through a series of guided imagery exercises to try to prompt her remembering of this experience. When the interviewer asked Aniko to imagine the person who cut her hair when this little two-year-old arrived in Theresienstadt, Aniko hesitated. But then she said, well, it might have been a middle-aged woman. Maybe she had a khaki uniform. I think she might have been blonde. And I will show you now, a, oh, sorry. I will show you a, um, a copy of the transcript. Aniko said, but I truly believe that I don't have any memories, you know? And the interviewer said, but listen, you are telling me so many memories. I never heard anyone tell me so many memories. So how can you tell me you have no memories? I just thought I don't have any. Well, look, you even remembered what this woman looked like, right? And in such detail. I never saw, I mean, I never thought that I could see her. You're trying to talk yourself into not having any memories, but you see the reason for it is probably because you want memories like an adult and that can't be. You can only have memories from the time when you were a child and the kinds of things you experienced, that she had dirty blonde hair, how old she was. You're telling me things that children observe. But when the interviewer asked again what color something was, Aniko attempted to stake out some territory between what was imagined and what was known. I don't know. I can try to remember, but I want to be truthful, you know. You are very truthful. I can't talk you into anything, and I shouldn't. It does not take a great leap of the imagination to recognize that the interviewer was in fact trying quite hard to talk Aniko into believing that her responses to leading questions were in fact memories. The Kestenberg Project collected stories that were collaborative fantasies, in some cases, and participants were aware of this, and sometimes they were upset by it. I should say though at this point that I actually think these interviews are absolutely fantastic sources and I wish uh, historians use them more. I, they, I use them a lot in the book, but I do so always keeping this sort of collaborative fantasy element in mind. Here guided imagery techniques and an insistence that vaguely felt sensations must indeed constitute memories were troubling to participants who struggled to clarify where the boundaries of the known lay in their stories or indeed which memories counted as valid parts of their own biographies. Let's jump forwards again, about 10 years this time, to the mid-1990s. By this point, there had been a meteoric rise in the public interest in the Holocaust, as well as the exponential growth of Holocaust-focused oral history which is a genre that was then and remains now generally referred to as Holocaust testimony. Now, as I argue in the book, and I only have time to just very briefly touch on here, there are really good reasons why scholars of that period chose to use the term Holocaust testimony rather than, for example, oral history. But the term has an exclusionary dimension that is rarely acknowledged. Testimony and the related term bearing witness have clear roots in a juridical context where witnesses set their memories out, it is hoped, authentically, credibly, logically, and truthfully. 
but a witness providing testimony and an interviewer collecting it understand the function of an interview in a particularly strict way. The emphasis must necessarily be on objectivity, on facts, and events set out in a logical order. In some ways, the very polar opposite of what I've been showing you uh, here with the Kestenberger interviews. As we saw in Aniko S.'s story, child survivors were often unsure of the veracity of their memories, often unable to put remembered facts in a logical order, and sometimes lack knowledge of the most basic facts behind their own origins. I think this is important to keep in mind that even in the 1990s, many of the children I look at in the book are by that point in their 50s, they still sometimes don't know where they came from, what happened to their parents, who they were. The large scale testimony projects of this period proved to be painful for child survivors to navigate because they couldn't easily map their stories onto an interviewing technique that stressed this kind of logical chunk, chunk, chunk progression of facts in a tidy order. So I've got an example taken from a collection which I imagine many of you are very familiar with, the Survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation Project, which was founded by Steven Spielberg in 1994. Survivors of the Shoah was a project with ambitions of scale. It had a goal, which was passed quite some time ago now, of collecting 50,000 interviews. So it necessarily stressed quantity over quality and took a kind of assembly line approach. Which again does not mean that these are not valuable documents. I have so enjoyed working with them, but you just have to bear this in mind uh, if you do work with them. Interviewers ask set questions that um, encourage interviewees to give a kind of linear account, a linear account of their experiences. And also to work, uh, I think this is also worth adding, so towards a cathartic narrative. And if you've ever seen any of these interviews, there's this practice of uh, at the end, you kind of, you know, bring out your spouse and your children to kind of, you know, to just sort of show that the success of your life, basically, that you have, in a way, um, won against those who tried to, tried to kill you by creating your own family. So this is definitely a, a sense in which there's an almost enforced kind of narrative of catharsis in these interviews at times. And this insistence on following a questionnaire was really difficult for child survivors because it very much exposed the gaps in their own knowledge. And rather than filling those gaps with sort of sensory imagining like the Kestenberg interviews had done, they punctured the narrative, sometimes accompanied by these really distraught emotional cues of these flustered interviewees who, who couldn't make, who couldn't create that kind of linear account. So I'll give you an example. Here is Denny M on the far right, the little boy leaning out on the far right. A child survivor of Theresian Stat, also actually one who, um, who spent some of his childhood at the Weir Courtney Care Home for Child Survivors in Surrey. He was interviewed by the Spielberg Project in 1997. He was 57 years old then. So the interviewer began by asking Denny where he had been born which thankfully was a question he could answer. But then she asked about his mother and Denny felt compelled to make it clear he didn't have very much information about his birth parents. He said, I don't actually remember her. I don't remember what she looked like. I know that she was born in Berlin. I have very little information about my mother. I don't know what her profession was and I know virtually nothing about her at all. And actually makes me quite uh, sad to reflect that. So I never met Denny. He died a couple of years after he gave that interview. Um, and it's, it's, it is sad for me to reflect on the fact that I actually know quite a lot more about his mother than he ever did in his own life. So the interviewer continued to press him. She asked about his father. He said, I have no information. I don't know his profession, schooling, or what he was like as a person. She asked if he had been aware that he was Jewish as a child. He said, no. She asked if he recalled any tastes or smells. No. She asked if he could describe his daily routine in Theresian stat, and that's where his composure really broke. And you can see from the ellipsis in this account 
all the times that he pauses. I don't know if I, I don't, I don't want to read it out in a way, and I'm sorry, I can't play it for you, but the, those interviews are not easily um, accessible. So I, when I, I, I listened to the interview originally, and then I've since then been working off my own transcript. I think what's important to keep in mind is that he says this time is a kind of jumble of memories of things which now don't very much make very much sense and probably didn't even make sense at the time. What I wish I could show you is the look on his face as he tries desperately to explain to this interviewer that he can't remember and it's not because he doesn't want to. It's because he was a small child and it's fractured. The memory is fractured. So trust between interviewers and participants fractured over this question of memory in these in the Spielberg interviews. The focus on detail-rich linear narratives upset a lot of child survivors. They recognized that their particular way of remembering could not possibly fit into that questionnaire format. Nor could child survivors embrace the project's imposition of a cathartic narrative pattern particularly where the use of questionnaires laid bare all those gaps in their stories. It's very hard to get catharsis out of a broken life narrative, I think. And over all those conditions lay the additional stricture of the idea of testimony, which seemed to demand a coherence and a logicality, which child survivors' memories refused to bend to. So to wind towards a conclusion, where are we today? Child survivors of the Holocaust now find themselves in a unique position. They've entered old age. They are for the most part, the only Holocaust survivors left. Their stories have also now made their way into the canon of Holocaust survival narratives. So we can sort of imagine the shape and form of that narrative it has now the weight of acceptance and authority, and that brings with it a different way of speaking. Child survivors have in some ways, of course, repackaged their experiences accordingly. In interviews conducted in recent years, including obviously the ones I did myself for this book, they often want to stress that their stories have happy endings, and they're encouraged to do so, I think, as we've seen by the format of a lot of contemporary interviewing projects, which emphasize the inspirational, the redemptive, and the legacy building aspects of survivor stories. What has been lost, I think, in 21st century ways of telling the story is just how far child survivors narratives speak to the multiple ruptures of the self over time. And indeed how deeply these ruptures are part of the essential fabric of the story. And I don't just mean for child survivors, but for many of us. The individual's need to smooth over the fractured elements of the story interacts with the audience's desire to hear a tale of how the broken self can be mended. So this is my final example. Here we have Sylvia R. born in 1935 in Woj, Poland. I interviewed her in 2015, but here you see her uh, obviously standing um, on a stage in front of a cheering audience. And this is at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum where every year she gives a talk in their first person speaker series. Interestingly, she um, only started doing after I interviewed her in 2015. So she's done it in recent years. Now she's a really great speaker. As you can tell, but look at this, you know, thrilled audience and, and she has a certain way of telling her story. So you can find her online and you'll, you'll see that she generally tells her story more or less the same way. She talks about how she was in the Woj ghetto with her family. And as time went by, there were more and more raids and deportations from the ghetto. And at some point, her father knew that you know, that there was going to be, there were going to be deportations. And so he took her to the cemetery. He dug a hole in the ground and he told her to get in it and he covered her up. And he said, you stay in here until I tell you it's safe to come out. So he basically dug a grave and she got in it and she stayed in it. And then in the end, he did come, he did tell her to get out and she got out of the grave and things went on. But when she tells her story to these audiences, 
she always says that's the point at which things changed because after that she was afraid and the fear never went away and she had nightmares not just after that incident but after the war for a long time that was the moment when but before that she was a kid she didn't realize how much danger she was in but after that moment she was afraid and that was the worst moment but when i interviewed her that's not the story she told me because of course my book is about children after the war. And so I said, well, Sylvia, tell me about your life after the war. You know, you tell me what happened during the war, fine, okay, but I'm really interested in, the, in your life afterwards. And like a lot of people I interviewed, she said, oh, I don't know why you're interested in that. It's not very interesting, you know, it's boring. I had an ordinary life. But anyway, because I was asking about a different sort of thing, she told me the story about the grave and she told me how it was the worst moment. But then she said something else. She said, that wasn't the worst moment in my life. Oh, really? What was the worst moment in your life? Well, that was when my husband died. That was a really hard time. That blew my mind because I think it is in some ways the most beautifully radical narrative. It challenged that reductionism that forms a lot of our current approach to survivor stories an approach that assumes what, what happened during the war must necessarily be the absolute worst thing that could have possibly happened and that afterwards, you know, life is kind of a slow, steady march away from that horror towards a successful rebuilding. No, she said, actually the worst bit was this very pedestrian event that we will, most of us go through in some capacity, the loss of a loved one. It has been challenging historically for those who survived the Holocaust as children to tell their stories, sorry, <clears throat> to tell their stories as they are, full of disjunctures, often pinned to half-truths, riven with unknowns. It remains challenging now. But looking at the silences in these stories, we see how far what they could not say has been shaped not by repression or psychological distancing, although of course those aspects exist for some people, not by their ability to speak, but by our ability to listen. Thank you.